Mormonism. And uh, we are blessed because the speaker of that conference is uh, here to speak to us this afternoon. Tonight, uh, the conference starts at 7 o'clock um, when Dr. Corey Miller, who I'll announce in uh, more detail in a minute, will be uh, speaking through his conversion story from Mormonism. He comes from a sixth generation Mormon family. And then tomorrow from 8.30 through to midday, he will be focusing on how to engage with uh, Mormons. Um, we live uh, in a community which has a lot of Mormons and, and so it's going to be a, a fantastic opportunity to learn to someone who has uh, spent a lifetime doing it, it seems a long time. So uh, that's 7 o'clock tonight, 8.30 tomorrow morning. There's no need to register anywhere, just turn up um, for the conference at Trinity Reformed Church. So Dr. Miller is uh, speaking to us this afternoon. He is the president, CEO of Ratio Christi. Uh, as I said, he grew up in Utah as a sixth generation Mormon, came to Christ in 1988. He has served on a partial staff at uh, numerous churches and has taught widely in universities and colleges around the country and has also published uh, widely. Uh, he's uh, served on Cruz Faculty Commons Ministry at Purdue and he is currently an adjunct professor of philosophy and comparative religions as well at Indiana University in Kokoma. Dr. Miller holds master's degree in philosophy, biblical studies and in philosophy of religion and ethics. His PhD is in philosophical theology from the University of Aberdeen. That's in Scotland, just in case you don't know. He is passionate about defending and proclaiming the truth of the gospel in winsome and bold ways. He lives with his wife Melinda and three children in Indiana and he will be speaking to us this afternoon on the state of the university. So please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Corey Miller. How much time do I have? Greetings. It is my pleasure to be here. Uh, really looking forward to the opportunity to engaging with you all. Uh, I had studied um, some down uh, sort of the, the avenue that you all are in now. Uh, many years ago I worked on a master's thesis on Cornelius Van Til. Did not finish it because I expedited the process to get to another master's degree by cutting off a semester and some of you know what that's like to try to hurry through things. Uh, I was at um, uh, David Bonson's home last week and uh, we brought this institute up. It was kind of an interesting happenstance that I was down there in Southern California recruiting at Biola University. And I've uh, lived up in the Northwest, uh, never this direction though. The GPS took me off-roading today on the way here and I didn't know that I would make it. <laughs> started to rain and the car started swerving and I thought oh boy <laughs> so this is what northern Idaho looks like this is great really pleased to be here uh, looked over your website uh, your faculty backgrounds uh, I'm impressed and, and really excited to engage with you guys and hope that maybe there's uh, something we can develop in terms of a partnership going forward as well a little bit about uh, my background. We're going to be talking about the challenge of the modern university. You may be familiar with that icon on the left. I was there on Yale's campus. I went there, went to Princeton, went to Columbia. Uh, kind of a little history buff and I, I love to see some of the our architecture and the historicity behind our nation's universities. And of course that one is looks at Veritas, Light and Truth, uh, a university upping the ante after they had lost Harvard and they decided to try again. Uh, and then one of their child prodigies, of course, Jonathan Edwards, took off and went over to Princeton. Uh, and then we had Columbia University up in the area. Just walking around the campus, you can see the architecture. You can see the writings etched in the buildings. That its, its motto still, talking about delighting in the Lord. And yet, 
Colombia is not even close to doing something like that. Uh, we've, gone, we've come a long way since then. Uh, Ratio Christi means the reason of Christ. It is a campus apologetics alliance. What separates us from other apologetics ministries is that we're on the campus. Uh, what separates us from other campus ministries is that we do apologetics, but not mere apologetics, apologetics evangelism, and we are evangelistic apologists. We want to do something about it and not just be eggheads with respect to the knowledge. Um, our little logo there, the sort of Venn diagram, represents that. Apologetics on, on one square, evangelism on the other, and our sweet spot is right there in the middle. kind of resonates with what your mission and vision statement is here as well. Our vision is thoughtful Christianity, where thoughtful is a double entendre, represents the heart of compassion and consideration and the mind of contemplation and reflection. Thoughtful Christianity, transforming lives on campus today, changing culture tomorrow. If you want to go uh, find out what's happening in the culture and you wonder why it's taking a, a massive dive in moral decay, you want to go upstream to find the problem, and upstream is the university, right? Um, and so we believe if we want to impact the culture uh, most saliently, we need to go to that causal nexus. Our mission is a global movement uh, equipping students and faculty with historical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for following Jesus. Again, it may seem like we're eggheads. We don't intend to be, but we can be nerdish like maybe some of you could be too. Uh, but we want to do something about it. We want to put feet on uh, the mind. We exemplify the mind. When you have the, the head, the hands, and the heart of Christ, it seems that the head of Christ has been disfellowshipped in modern evangelicalism. And if there's anywhere that it ought to be on display, it's at the universities. And so we put that aspect of that feature forward even though we say look if, if someone needs a hug uh, we want to give them a hug if they need an argument we are the ministry on campus to give them an argument but we want to be good diagnosticians uh, as Epictetus the Greek philosopher said we have two ears and one mouth for a reason we want to listen more we want to personalize our, our approach to people and personalize our approach to culture as well you've heard the statistics uh, and then statistics, you know, what, what to do, what to do, you, you kind of uh, take an average, but in soul-searching the religious and spiritual lives of American teens, uh, we see that one of the biggest reasons that people cite uh, for their dropout rate or their lack of interest in Christianity is for skeptical and intellectual reasons. Uh, you have, you know, statistics again, 60, 70, 80 percent, let's take an average, 70 percent apostasy rate going off into the universities. Now many of those come back later once they, you know, bump up against reality, start having kids and realize life doesn't work the way that, um, you know, my university professors and the fraternities told me on Friday nights that it does, right? Uh, but many don't. And regardless, you know, if I were speaking to a, a group, uh, a Wesleyan campus as opposed to a Reformed, uh, you would, of course, debate the issue, well, were they once saved, always saved, all that kind of stuff, right? I, I'm in support raising ministry, by the way, and, and we, we find all kinds of humor in this. Uh, there's no Calvinism in support raising. It's never once supported, always supported, but, you know. <laughs> So if we can re successfully recruit you and I can get you to raise your support, and you, you say, well, how much does it pay? I say, uh, you, you can get a raise anytime you want. You just have to go raise it. <laughs> it's attractive, right? <laughs> hey, look, how many of you are in, are in philosophy majors here? <laughs> Everybody? <laughs> All right, so when I was at Purdue, the faculty used to joke, what's the difference between a philosophy degree and a pizza? One feeds the family. <laughs> That's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Worse, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm digressing here. Uh, but when one of the MA students didn't make it onto the PhD program, two weeks later, my wife and I ordered Domino's, and guess who delivered? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Barna's Reviving Evangelism, a quest for a new direction. And out of a dozen options, not got to pick, 
the answer to that, and believers got to pick the answer to that. Out of a dozen options, almost half of the non-believers picked better evidence to support it. What most intrigues them or interests them or would interest them in Christianity? Better evidence to support it. They don't think there is much. They don't get it from most of their pastors. Families are not equipping in the way they ought or once did. And certainly they're not getting it out of our education system. Uh, yet this option was almost, you know, the opposite. It was picked dead last by believers who, you know, only 12% of them thought that non-believers would say that. It may indicate that our church is woefully out of touch with where our culture is is at. Technology is evil. For me there is hell and there is technology. Ah, there we go. Did I go back too far? There we go. <laughs> here we go. Second time here. Woo. No, almost, almost. I managed to reverse it. Am I not pointing properly? Point back the other way. Back here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where's it? Okay. <laughs> the, uh, the challenge, maybe I need to... Where's my object right there? Uh, the, the challenge is that neo-atheists and neo-Marxists are evangelizing and conscripting our children. You know, we used to talk about the neo-atheists after 9-11, right? Things went bad, we weren't sure what Islam even was. Uh, very soon after that, people started to say, in the name of God, well, what about Christianity? And people would say, well, you can't make the comparison between Jesus and Muhammad. They're night and day. Yeah, but Jesus, the Jew, owns the Old Testament, and he owes us an explanation, right? So the new, new atheist uh, took a dive into what we might call the biblical problem of evil as opposed to the more generic problem of evil. But the new atheists aren't the biggest problem anymore. In my view, it's the neo-Marxists. And in fact, I'm forging some very strange alliances right now uh, with some of the neo-atheists that I have more in common with free speech on campus than I do the neo-Marxists or some Christian leaders, including pastors. And then maybe we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But it's not just that they're trying to evangelize and give us their good news, their version of the good life, their utopia. Uh, but they're conscripting our people the same way that Hitler did as he rolled across Europe. Um, you know, train them up in the way they should go and when they get older, they get defeated or conscripted or something has gone wrong. It's not the way it ought to be. Daniel Dennett, uh, one of the neo-atheists, they will see me as just another liberal professor trying to cajole them out of some of their convictions and they are dead right about that. That's what I am. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, they don't pull any punches. They don't, they don't try to hide this stuff. Uh, I saw this when I was at Purdue. I saw it when I was at IU. I have to be very careful. All the textbooks that I require my students to uh, use are atheist or agnostic. Uh, one time I had a Christian author and I got called on the carpet for it. You know that the atheists on the other side of the hall are not giving the same uh, courtesy um, because they dominate the universities and they can say and do what they want. Richard Rorty, more in the humanities area. So we are going to go right on trying to discredit you in the eyes of your children, trying to strip your fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. Of course, he is famous for saying, truth is that which my peers will let me get away with. Hmm. One in the Northwest that I'm in discussion with right now about possibly doing a panel, and uh, some kind of a real odd alliance on this issue of free speech. He told uh, our regional director up in Portland that his target is no longer Christians, it's social justice. Um, he says, employing universities in this book, A Manual for Creating Atheists, which was, um, you know, the foreword was by Michael Shermer, endorsed by Richard Dawkins. Uh, employing universities in the struggle against faith is a cornerstone in the larger strategy to combat faith, promote reason and rationality. 
and create skeptics. Many university graduates will become the next generation of leaders and policymakers. We need to train educators not just to teach students how to think critically, but also how to nudge attitudes about faith on their downward spiral. Wow, that seems like it, it, it comes right out of our book. He's famous for developing what's called street epistemology um, in terms of going out on the campuses and trying to defaith believers by Socratic dialogue. But he sees exactly what our ministry's focus is, and that is the fact that the universities are the most influential institution, or at least one of them, uh, in Western civilization. Uh, from them come our doctors, lawyers, K-12 educators, our business leaders, political leaders, engineers, our future leaders, and in, in fact our future professors, right? Out of these what you might call secular baptismal fonts, he gets this and they're trying to be very intentional about uh, maintaining status quo, maintaining the growth model. They're willing to accept our tuition dollars and accept our, you know, our posterity to be able to recruit and, and uh, assimilate. Uh, I didn't push that, come on. Ah. They're willing to do all of that, but they don't want us necessarily to finish the PhD and then if you finish, you've got to go on for a job, then you've got to get tenure, then you want to get the full professorship, and then even, even at that point, they can still make your life very hard. I can tell you countless stories. My, my own story, uh, I was in my fifth year at Purdue University. I was ABD, had all my coursework done, languages, exams, uh, funded from a different department, and I was told I had too much of a faith perspective and I had to terminate with a five-year master's degree, puts the THN to shame, which is what launched me into faculty ministry when I realized how hostile certain uh, departments can be and in certain areas around the country. Um, Hitler said, give me the textbooks and I will control Germany, and he did. It was not about power, it was about ideas, right? Stalin said that ideas are more powerful than weapons. We don't allow our enemies to have weapons, why should we let them have ideas? The other side knows this. Interestingly, the reason why Boghossian has now shifted his target is because uh, what happened many years ago after uh, Marxism 101, classical Marxism failed, World War II, World War I came around, they were supposed to put on their boots and revolt. But they didn't. They put on their boots and they went to war against other nations. They couldn't figure it out and thought, okay, let's go to Frankfurt. Let's think this through. Let's double down and try Marxism 201, neo-Marxism, the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, where we can think more uh, strategically if we don't have the power to have a radical revolution, perhaps a soft revolution. And we can infiltrate the non-coercive elements of society, like education and religion, rather than the coercive elements, like military or government or law enforcement. You go after the former, and the latter will soon follow. 19, early 1930s rolls around. The Nazis come to power, the National Socialists. Of course, the Marxists are socialists too. They're international socialists. And so the internationals and the nationalists didn't really get along well any more than Hitler or Stalin did. And they realized, we better get out of here. It was a bad place to be if you were a Marxist and a Jewish thinker, uh, even if you were an atheistic Jewish thinker, like many in their school of thought were. So where did they go? They took off over the pond, and they ended up at Columbia University where they had a very, very patient, strategic outlook on cultural infiltration, going through the humanities, uh, eventually rising to the occasion where they were able to take power without brandishing a sword. And now, what the naturalists on the, the uh, hard science side of the campus have done in terms of making room for this in this laboratory experiment this Frankenstein has emerged, and now they can't even control them on the other side of the campus. And they're wondering what to do, what to do. People like Dawkins, Peter, people like Steven Pinker at Harvard, Boghossian and others are really scared about this new, call it what you want, social justice, 
political correctness, identity politics, neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, synonymous. On a good day, yes, in the, evan in the evangelical world, we think about loving the poor and the downtrodden and the oppressed. That's not what most people, especially not in the secular universities, make of that term of reproductive justice, of economic justice, of uh, this kind of justice and that kind of justice, which ends up oftentimes being injustice divides the world into a worldview of oppressed and oppressors. You're either one or the other. And there is no room for arguing with these folks. The neo-atheists, there were. So it's, it's really interesting to see what's happening in our culture right now, how different kind of alliances are, are forming. It, it reminds me a bit of what happened with Islam. You had the Sunnis and the Shiites, uh, which were mortal enemies unless there was a Jew in the room, right? And then 9-11 comes around and suddenly you get this new fissure cutting between both of them, between the radicals and the, and the moderates, right? And the radicals are making a historical argument for jihad. The moderates, they say, are domesticated by the West and are not real Muslims. And so new alliances start forming. And it's interesting uh, conversations I've been having with people like this and you know, the Jordan Peterson types about freedom on campus. Just this Thursday, we got news about a uh, federal case that we just won uh, in Colorado. Um, well, it'll almost be won. They're giving up too early. We were hoping to, uh, they'd fight a little bit longer so we could take it to the Supreme Court next. Uh, we won one at Kennesaw State, a federal case earlier in the year. We've been in 17 cases of legal proceedings, and it seems like these things are just ramping up. Uh, they don't see the sense in, in free speech or free association or anything like that on the campuses. They own the campuses. When we look at the American situation with the church and say campus ministry, uh, just as a, a historical uh, nod, the reason it was said that the campus ministries like say Campus Crusade or InterVarsity or Navigators emerged whether one likes that or not, or has an opinion on it, was because they felt like the church wasn't doing its proper job in terms of reaching the campuses. Now, we're on 2.0 there. Ratio Christi has emerged as sort of a para-church para because it seems like most aren't doing their jobs at reaching the campuses. Uh, we're using a model of the 70s and we lost the entire millennial generation. We were using an Acts 2 model, not an Acts 17 model, and we were already in Acts 17 in our culture. So we reached Generation Z now, and we're sort of already there. But the Great Commission, and we can think about the Great Commission expanding that to the cultural mandate today as well, we know what that is. Uh, apologetics, you know, sometimes has a bad rap, uh, it kind of reminds me, sorry I'm digressing again, but I remember one time I was at Purdue, we had a philosopher come in to do a colloquium. Uh, it was uh, Richard Swinburne, no less, from Oxford, one of the top uh, evangelical philosophers in philosophy of religion. And right in the middle of the talk, I heard this, ah! and I just thought, you know, I knew there were some jerks in this department, but come on. At least let the guy finish and then take him down, right? Because that's the name of the game in philosophy. Someone gets up and reads a paper. First thing you do, as soon as they're done, first one to take their viewpoint down wins. Sort of a hospitable, non-contact sport, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, I thought this was kind of rude. And um, they were nice atheists. William Rowe, I was his last student. He was famous for what I call the Bambi argument, uh, famous for the problem of evil. Um, he was a nice atheist. He had given me a letter of recommend. But there were some, some ruthless people in the department, and I just thought, boy, this is, this is over the top. And it turns out this guy uh, was a former Christian, had attended a Bible college. We had two of them in our department, uh, sort of like a Bart Ehrman, and um, became an atheist. He was having a seizure. And I don't know that it was God giving him the seizure, but he was down there, and uh, one of the believing professors, who looks like ZZ Top, Jan Cover, jumps down on his knees, and you know, he says, he looks up and he says, is there a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? 
and you hear everyone, you know, raising their hand, I, I have a doctorate, I have a doctorate, I have a doctorate. <laughs> no, a real doctor, someone practical. <laughs> All right, so that last part didn't really happen, but I remember that going through my imagination. Look, boy, I'm working on this PhD, thinking I'm going to change the world, but I can't even help this poor sap out. Um, and then there's the pizza joke. Uh, but, you know, uh, turn, turn the name and talk about apologetics, and the same sort of thing happens. Eyes just roll inside of the church or outside of the church. You know, I mean, have you ever met an apologist before? Can you say lack of personality, right? I mean, that's typically, you know, they, they think geek and can they, you know, can they really relate to the world? They, philosopher, scientist, apologist sometimes have a PR problem, right? Uh, so we need to do better at that. But um, a lot of pastors don't see the value of this. They don't see the relevance. I was on staff at a church in the Northwest and we were at a pastoral staff retreat and I was reading this book why I am a Christian and I was reading one chapter by a guy who was a former atheist and converted and, and I, I had still been dealing with some doubt uh, coming out of Mormonism and I remember him looking over my shoulder and he says what are you reading and I showed him and he says is that stuff even relevant anymore and I just thought oh Lord I just got accepted at Purdue maybe I need to stay here <laughs> the church is hurting the universities are, are hurting uh, the church sees no need for it yet it's not a suggestion. It's like the ten, ten suggestions. It's in the imperative. It's a command. Be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that's in you and do it with gentleness and respect. In that context, we see the head, the heart, and the hands of Christ. It's not like you're you know, going to become an egghead. Uh, but you think about the context in which this took place as well. Uh, Peter, that context was about suffering, diaspora. You know, the church was going through some difficult times. And how can you hang on to your faith like this? How do you still do this? You just curse God and die, as we heard someone say in the Old Testament in the book of Job, right? And out of that context, be ready always to give an answer. Um, we think about apologetics sometimes as just being logos. But it's more than just logos. It's the head, the hand, and the heart. And it's, it's a command. And it happens to be relevant, and it happens to be back in demand in this culture more than ever before, perhaps, in this particular culture. And in fact, I think we are coming closer and closer to the first and second century church. Uh, this context about suffering uh, is similar to where you know, 100 AD, John dies, Justin Martyr gets born, ha, oh, case for reincarnation, just kidding. Um, you know, baby died, never mind. Uh, John, uh, John dies, Justin Martyr is born, writes a few books, Dialogue with Trifle the Jew, and then two uh, letters to the Senate and the Emperor. And his apologies were not just, you know, your evidence demands a verdict type stuff, it was defending against charges of being an insurrectionist, being a bad citizen. And his response is that Christians aren't bad citizens. No, we're not going to worship Caesar as Kurios, as Lord, but other than that, we can be the best of citizens. When no one else is looking, and we could get away with it and not get caught, we have an obligation, a bigger obligation, to obey government so long as it doesn't forbid us to do that which God requires or require us to do that which God forbids, we have an obligation and we answer to someone higher. We can be the best of citizens. That was an apologetic that he gave. Well, in today's culture, uh, you get David Kinnaman's book that comes out, Good Faith, What to Do When a Society Looks at You as an Extremist or Irrelevant. 40% of adults think of proselytizing as extremist. 60% think you're an extremist if you're a Christian proselytizing. Wow, that's not equality, <laughs> right? But the good news is 50% still see the church as relevant. And when you ask what that means, food pantries, keeping the kids off the streets and things like that. But once you tell them why you're keeping the kids off the streets and providing for the food pantry, now you're an extremist again. It's not a good time in this culture to be a believer. And our apologetic is coming nearer and nearer, I think, to the first and second century. At least it seems to be moving in that direction. Apologetics is relevant for pre-evangelism. Francis Schaeffer would say taking the roof off, right? Uh, removing obstacles. 
evangelism proper, you know, you're giving their evidence for the resurrection and the implications of the atonement, sometimes they're simultaneous. Post-evangelism, uh, you know, belief comes in degrees. Belief has uh, content, truth and falsity. It also has centrality, you know, is it on the peripheral edges of my beliefs? Is it Mac or a PC or Coke or Pepsi better? It's not going to rock my world, but if you, if you take out the hub, you know, the God factor, that rocks everything, right? The centrality of a belief. And then beliefs come in degrees. If I believe something 51%, I'm barely really believing it. 49% disbelieving it. 70% I'm probably going to act on it. 90%? Oh yeah, I'm an activist, right? It's that time that I, I kind of like Marx's statement. You know, uh, historically, the philosophers have sought to interpret the world, but the purpose is, after all, to change it. You're someone that's an activist at that time. Post-evangelism. You give people confides, confidence, belief, trust. You increase that level, they're much more likely to act upon it. These are believers. You're not converting believers. You're reinforcing belief, and you're calling them to action. Apologetics is relevant before, during, and after. And it's a command. Uh, coming back to the universities for a moment, uh, Harvard, first university founded by the Puritans, 1636, Veritas, capital V, or capital T truth, what else would they be? It's the, you know, you're the Puritans. Um, Veritas Christo et Ecclesiae, for Christ and the church, just a couple decades after, it kept that nomenclature until the 300 year anniversary, 1936. Interesting, right when things were going bad at the Frankfurt School in Germany and they came over to the school down the road to Columbia, um, things were brewing at the time, right? We as American evangelicals abdicated our role and responsibility in high culture, focusing intently on harvest crusade after harvest crusade after harvest crusade. We were not thinking strategic. The Marxists were, and others were. And we pull out and left these things as a vacuum, and now we're sending our posterity there. And those in the university have figured out a clever way to get parents to pay for the demise of their own kids. The empires of the future will be empires of the mind, Churchill said at his 1943 address. Um, you know, if this is my computer, it is just not bright. I think I turned off the brightness on it earlier. I don't know if you can fix that. Uh, but um, recently, in the Crimson, Harvard's Crimson, the incoming class, this coming fall, the largest religious category for Harvard freshmen in 2019 is atheist agnostic. For the first time ever, more than the combination of Catholic and Protestant sort of tells you where we've gone from, from Harvard, and of course we have some professors there that uh, give at least lip service to pedophiliaism as long as it's practiced in a healthy way. Uh, you have the millennials, you have Gen Z. The millennials, we're not even talking about them. Some people are. We're on the campuses. You don't have the millennials there anymore. They're gone in more ways than one. Um, but Gen Z, they're the undergrads right now. 26% um, of the population, they're uh, described with several features, more than this, but some of the top. The iGen ministry or group, it's, it's, they know tech. I have problems uh, like no one else and I just call my nine-year-old and she comes and helps me. Uh, multiracial, 2020 whites will be the minority. It's a multiracial world now. Um, Sexually fluid, 73% embrace gay marriage as Gen Z. Interestingly, the abortion thing has sort of gone the other way, I think, but gay marriage, uh, and I think because of the rhetoric of compassion both ways, the way the language is, uh, you know, construed the issues. But 73%, three out of every four Gen Zers are going to be pro-gay marriage. And you can't get away from that issue. We have to apply not just cultural apologetics, but rhetorical apologetics to this. Uh, something I didn't share, but right after I had lost that first PhD attempt, went on staff with Campus Crusades faculty ministry to go after professors because 
of the, the power there. Uh, but I was also teaching at an Indiana University, and I had a uh, pastor who turned gay. He ends up in my class as one of my students in ethics. I'm using an atheist textbook. We get to the part about the Bible and sexuality, and of course the author trashes that. And usually that's my time to come out of the closet. You know, you wait till about mid mid semester so I can build up some credibility. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> He called me on the carpet, called me a homophobe right in front of the class, went straight to the main campus. The attorneys picked it up. It was the year the big business uh, boycotted uh, Indiana like Hollywood's trying to do with Georgia right now. Mike Pence unfortunately capitulated and I was one of their adjuncts that fell off the, the wagon. IU went public opposing the conservative legislature and that was the same year that I just happened to get charged with creating a suicidal environment merely because I gave an education and gave both sides rather than an indoctrination. So I was in legal proceedings and I had two atheists, one a pantheist, one an atheist, uh, get my back and force the university to listen to the lectures that they had recorded. They said, we don't agree with Dr. Miller's view on sexuality or belief in God, but he did nothing wrong. And if you guys punish him for this, we will transfer to a different university because this is not free thinking. Brothers, I'm in trial for the resurrection. <laughs> Strange alliances. And Alliance Defending Freedom came in, took my case pro bono, and I was exonerated. And then within a year after that, I'm facing it over at Aberdeen, where my external examiner had just gone through a, uh, a sex change operation, and I'm just thinking, oh, Lord, just come. <laughs> uh, <laughs> socialist, um, recession, uh, they follow AOC, there's compassion. I saw on your book list, you've probably all read Das Kapital, and you know, when you read that kind of stuff, you can see where Marx and others would go, wow, my heart is just bleeding and this is just so sad, right? Um, but we think a little bit longer and we see some problems that end up there. But the number one feature that describes this chief characteristic is post-Christian. And by post-Christian what I mean is, in the past you could rely on a conversation where um, somebody believed at least the Bible was generally reliable. They believed in a Judeo-Christian kind of an ethic. Um, they believed in God's existence. Maybe didn't, uh, didn't, well, they believed that God existed if they didn't believe in God's existence. But none of those things are the case anymore. Not on the secular university campus. It's a, it's a new world. This is not our grandmother's America anymore. And if we continue to try to reach Gen Z like we did the millennials, that's just a lost cause. We might as well just you know, eat, eat pizza together because that's mutually edifying. It's not going to be productive. Um, it gets worse. Let's look at the students that are coming into the university. A 2017 Yale National Student Survey. Almost half of students surveyed support campus speech codes. That's what we just won a federal suit at Kennesaw State for. 81% uh, say words are a form of violence. That's important. Four out of five think words are a form of violence. And so one third says that physical violence is justified to prevent violence. Uh, Self-contradictory, but it's like the student in my classroom who turned me in. I said, I thought, well, I thought we talked about tolerance. What about tolerance? And he said, I don't believe in being tolerant to the intolerant, and smiled. Uh, one third, physical violence is justified to prevent hate speech. And what is hate speech? 66% say hate speech is anything students believe to be considered hurtful to a particular person. And when we're in this day of social justice, identity politics, political correctness, neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, critical theory, call it what you want, arose under any other names, the same thing. Largely, there are some distinctions, but there is a whole lot in common there. It's a Trojan horse of a term, if you ask me. Uh, we've got big problems with the students that are coming in. The professors are scared. The neo-atheist professors are scared. Uh, and by the way, if I can just back up a little bit, I don't know if you know the story about Peter Boghossian and why he's in trouble and they might discipline him at Portland State University. It's because he and two other atheists did a hoax last year and they submitted 20-plus academic papers to peer-reviewed journals on 
uh, very leftist kind of journals, grievance studies and so forth, and they made it all up, and they got half of them accepted in major peer-reviewed journals. And their point was there's some serious corruption going on here, and now their own are coming back to eat them um, because of this new direction. Uh, you know, with the, with the modernists, the naturalists, they at least believed truth was real and objective. They reduced it down to anything that is subject to chemistry and physics, but at least they believed truth was real. For the postmodernists, they don't even believe that. Remember, truth is what my peers will let me get away with. Truth is a social construct of reality. That's what dominates the humanities departments. Bloomberg, in a recent Harvard um, speech he gave, a commencement speech, Imagine this, you just want to pull him off the stage if this was you graduating. He said that conservative faculty members are at risk of becoming an endangered species. He's right. And you can go on Bloomberg.com and you can download the entire uh, uh, program and speech that he gave. He said that Harvard, like other Ivy League schools, is a good university, but it's not a great university. That's where they want to pull him off and say, I'm offended, I'm triggered. Uh, diversity of gender, great. Diversity of ethnicity, great. Sexual orientation, great. But to be a great university, you need to have one more piece of diversity. Viewpoint diversity. And that is lacking at Harvard and all the Ivy Leagues. He said when 96% of all campaign contributions from Ivy League faculty and employees went to Barack Obama, you have to wonder whether students are being exposed to the diversity of views that a great university should offer. Wow, he just pulled out of the Democratic uh, race for president. This is not about, I'm not up here to tell you whether you ought to be a you know, political Democrat or Republican or anything like that. What I'm saying is this is not a university. This is a monolithity. It's, it's one view, it's a secularist and oftentimes hostile view to the Christian viewpoint. I've recently become a member of Heterodox Academy, uh, started by Jonathan Haidt, who claims to be a leftist, atheist, secularist, Jew. But he sees what's going on here. He sees that this is an echo chamber and it's bad for education when you have something like this. And he has said recently along the lines of a Jordan Peterson kind of commentary, he said that the universities are at the point where we need to decide. Are you going to be a truth university or a social justice university? You cannot be both. Brown University is an example of a social justice university, he said. Purdue, whoo, Princeton and University of Chicago are leading contenders in the field of being truth universities. But to this day, only 60 plus universities have signed on to that pact out of 4,500. No wonder Trump had to give an executive order for free speech. Now about viewpoint diversity then. Haidt said that liberal to conservative professors, the ratio was two to one in the 90s. Recent Washington Times articles showed that the ratio was 12 to 1 for those getting ready to retire at ages 65 and older. We're trying to teach our professors in our ministry to uh, rehire before you retire. Think about a legacy. It gets worse for the younger scholars coming in at 36 and under. It's 23 to 1. And in religion departments, it's 70 to 1. And the most recent survey to come out, there are dozens of universities, some top ones, that don't have a single faculty member who's, say, a Republican in their college. Again, I'm not pushing, be a Republican, be a Democrat. Jesus wasn't one of those parties. We don't want to mix that kind of uh, stuff. But there is no diversity in thought. And one party does go more secular than the other. Uh, George Yancey is one of our, our uh, missional professors. He's a uh, sociology professor at University of North Texas. He used to write all his books on race studies. He's African American. He was interviewed twice, uh, a couple of, in two years ago, by New York Times. And in the interview, he said, you know, in the past, uh, I've been persecuted for being black. He said, but it's nothing compared to the persecution I face being an evangelical in a secular academy. Now all of his books are about Christophobia in America. And in one of his recent books, Compromising Scholarship, uh, Religious and Political Bias in American Academia, 
he, as a sociologist, went out and surveyed academics across the nation, multidisciplinary, and he asked the question, if a, if a person came into your department wanting a job, and they described themselves by one of 27 items, would it make you more or less likely to hire them? Down at the very bottom, the absolute worst was a fundamentalist. In 26th spot, least preferential was evangelical. Of course, many collapsed those two as well, right? A couple above that, um, you know, you had NRA member, a few above that, Muslim, several above that, uh, you know, Green, uh, green Party, um, transgender. Up at the very top, you get the impression that uh, if you want to have the ultimate preference, the ultimate privilege in the university, you go into a department and say, hey, I want a job here. Well, tell me about yourself. I'm a Democrat. You're hired. Now, where did you go to college? <laughs> Again, this is not at all about becoming a Republican or becoming a Democrat. I'm not trying to weigh in on one or the other. I'm saying that the academy is dominated with one particular viewpoint, which is why you're now starting to see people like Steven Pinker at Harvard writing his book, Enlightenment Now, The Case for Science and Secularism and Humanism. And Bill Gates writes on the top of it, my new favorite book of all time. He's in fear of this stuff. Dawkins is in fear of this stuff. Bogosian is in fear of, of what's happening. They start to see, Michael Shermer is starting to see some of this stuff and calling for viewpoint diversity. The universities have become radicalized, uh, worse than they were, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Harvard's, uh, Harvard's motto, where did we go? Truth for Christ in the church used to require freshmen to take Hebrew as a missionary training center. Uh, today it's just truth, small t. Uh, it's got some crazy profs there. Stephen Pinker's not crazy, but his views are. He was just at Purdue a little while ago. Come on. Parents, pastors, and concerned citizens face a well-defended fortress. Responses that we give at Rocio Christi, our college prep program, we work in tandem with the local churches. I know a lot of campus ministries in the past have had bad PR with churches, maybe call themselves a church, maybe be bring bad uh, vibes to being a campus ministry. Is that even a legit ministry, right? I've been on pastoral staff, and so I've seen from both sides. And on a good day, you're viewed as a parachurch. Uh, on a bad day, you're a parasite, you know, just coming in to rape the congregation of all their money and then keep the students on the campus. We want to be churchmen. Uh, we see ourselves as really not just a parachurch, but a paraparachurch. We help the other campus ministries as well. We need to. You see the numbers. They're staggering. Uh, we don't have time to sit in our silos anymore. We can do bigger and better things together. Not that we have to forego our idiosyncratic best practices and discipleship or our theological view being the true theological view, uh, but we need to unite. That's valuable to Jesus too. We need to reclaim the intellectual voice of Christ at these secular universities that were once ours for the first 150 years in America, in South Korea, in India, all the first universities in Europe. Those were ours, and they took them over, and now we struggle with sending our children there. University chapters, we're on about 150 universities across the nation. Uh, we've got chapters in Pakistan, South Africa, Philippines. Uh, just got a, a, an agreement with a Bible college there in the Philippines. Uh, to grant master's degrees in apologetics. Uh, first class graduates in 2021. We've got a study center in London. Uh, got a guy raising his support for a chapter in Israel. We're on the move uh, from UCLA to Rutgers. Uh, and we want you to join us at the local universities around here and plant chapters. So you thought you came here for free today. It's going to cost you. Uh, RC Prof, you win the professor and you win their classroom too for 30 years. Just a small, brief story here. I told you I was William Rowe's last student. I studied under William Lane Craig in one of my degrees, and I wanted to test the metal by going to a secular university, covering over my evangelical past, 
so to speak, for political purposes, like the Trojan horse entering the city of Troy so that I could get into the secular university with their street creds. And when I got there, six weeks into it, I'm, I'm getting mocked for my faith. I get a permanent note in my file from a distinguished professor of Marxism that I'm delusional and schizophrenic and then finally lost it, you know, in the fifth year. But I thought, you know, this was all, all reflection. Uh, it, everything was reflecting, all swirling together when I no longer had an option at Purdue. And I, I remember William Rowe taking me to lunch one day downtown in Lafayette. And he gave me his testimony. Turns out he wasn't uh, always an atheist. He began at Detroit Bible College in Michigan. He was on his way to Fuller Seminary. While at Michigan, there was a hair splitting between, uh, you know, the uh, certain theologian and the administration. They fired him. Rowe told me he thought that was entirely too political. He's not interested in that. He's just interested in the thought life. So he went down the road to Wayne State University, going to finish up in philosophy, very close to theology, and then go to Fuller Seminary and go into some kind of a teaching ministry. He never made it to Fuller. While at Wayne State, he studied under a philosopher who captured him with such charisma, whose dad and, pastor and, and grandfather were both pastors. And the rest was history. Rowe wrote his famous Bambi argument on, on the animal uh, problem of evil and why couldn't God just change that little thing, that one little thing, built a 30, 35 year career at Purdue and then retired and I was his last student or student class. And it just hit me at that time wondering, um, you know, and you don't have to get too theological on once saved, always saved, and, you, know, you know where your theology can take this one way or the other, but nonetheless, God is sovereign and trajectories could have gone different ways and I just found it interesting that when I was at Talbot uh, studying under uh, William Lane Craig we studied about Nietzsche and Aristotle and Augustine and Aquinas and William Rowe and when I was out at Purdue I went back to Utah for a Christmas break one time to deliver a sermon at a church on the problem of suffering and the goodness of God Step down, post-sermon conversation, a student comes up to me and said, hey, I'm like you, I'm on break here, and uh, I'm a philosophy student at the University of Nebraska. We're in this class where we're using a guy's books by the name of William Rowe. Do you know him? Do you know how to get around his arguments? And I said, yeah, you're not going to believe it. I have him this semester. Well, I started wondering, what kind of different stories would have been told if there was a missional professor in that classroom 30 years ago at Wayne State? Counterfactuals. Uh, would my conversations in Utah have been different? Would I have studied about just one different philosopher at Talbot? Uh, how many different trajectories and stories would have been modified? And then I thought about it. Oh, there was a missional professor. He just wasn't one of ours. And that's par for the course in the secular university. And best case scenario, you say that Christians who maintain their salvation, that's my view, and I know it's the view of the school here too, you say they still get destroyed. Belief comes in degrees and you can lessen or increase belief and activism based on that, right? We need to be about reclaiming the intellectual voice of the universities. Almost no one is going after professors. And yet I consider that one of the greatest omissions of the Great Commission. It's the bully pulpit of the whole structure and no one is reaching them. We want to reach professors. You get the professor, you get their classroom too for 30 years. Half my work at Purdue with professors was not even reaching the non-Christians. It was trying to get the majority who were professors who happened to be Christians to start being Christians who happened to be professors, be missional professors. Even the card-carrying evangelicals who were elders in our churches were methodological naturalists. They were department heads in psychology and physics. And yet still they were methodological naturalists and if your research program is that then you're going to have a terrible time with your conclusions. I want to play this. This is a student um, last year just before you push play up there. This guy last year I'm driving with uh, the pastor of the church I was attending and we're going to a prayer meeting and he says, so a, a guy got baptized last week in church and you weren't there to see it. And I go, oh, tell me about it. He says, well, apparently he was saved through your ministry on Purdue's campus. I was like, oh, really? I didn't hear about that. Of course, I'm the president and I've got as much to do on Purdue's campus as I do at UCLA because I'm thinking about other things. But I, I'd met him before. Turns out both he and his wife were atheists. He was a... a, a 
PhD student, um, and he went out to uh, a pub after lab one night with five atheists in the PhD program and one believer who is the president of our club, right? Makes you all proud of the reform school here, right? I'm digressing again, but I drove into town and I saw an alehouse and I thought, school's got to be close around here. <laughs> <laughs> if it was a Baptist school, it'd be different, but it's a Presbyterian school. You've got to have the facial hair and the pipe and, uh, you know. <laughs> Cultural. <laughs> uh -oh. uh, volume, Does that, is that going to work? Go for it. Played it twice here. <laughs> Godzilla movies. Looks like it only has the music. It's good music. All right, let's move on to the next one. I will say what happened was they went out to the pub talking about moral philosophy. Four of the atheists peeled off, said, I'm not interested in going home. This guy said, I think you're on to something. They stuck around for a little while longer, a couple hours more. Our guy said at the end, he said, look, you don't believe yet anyway. Why don't you do a, an experiment like our faculty advisor, a physics professor, says to do? Well, what's that? Pray. Hmm. Okay. He went home, came back some duration later, I think it was a couple, I forget, a couple days, a week, whatever. He came back and he said, you're not going to believe this. I did the experiment and I'm getting baptized next week. <laughs> right? Got this guy, he now graduated with his PhD. Had another guy come in, paid by the Chinese government to spend one year studying under that Marxist professor at Purdue. Our group was meeting at the same time that his class was to meet with that guy. We got him to come to our group, paid for by the Chinese government, a year later, he's going on the job market in China as a Christian philosophy professor. Uh, how about this one? Let's try this. That one work? These are professor friends of mine at Purdue. We had seven of them. have to say here. I can get you that information later if you're interested. But this is what it looks like to have a movement convert from being professors who happen to be Christians to Christian professors, missional professors. That guy in the Department of Psychology, uh, one time we were going through, we were doing an R&D group. I call them reading and discussion groups, but because Purdue's an engineering science school, they like to call it research and development, so we just say R&D. We were doing one uh, for, focused on the psychology department, getting psych students to come in, doing it on human nature and the soul. Uh, it was looking at Augustine and Aquinas, Tillich, um, Maslow. It was his turn to lead, and he was leading the chapter on Augustine. And he got there and he said, okay, so now that we no longer believe in the existence of the soul, what can we take away from this chapter? And I looked over at him and I just thought, Tom, you go to a legalistic Baptist church and you just said that. Um, 
got him into Alvin Plantinga, he consumed it, came away from there and says, wow, if I had had this stuff 30 years ago, it may have changed the trajectory. Another guy who, read, who led the nuclear lab in physics, personal supporter of mine, gave me a kick in the teeth every month during my second PhD to make sure I finished. He's one of my personal supporters. He was an elder at our church. He wouldn't read intelligent design literature for two years, much less just say creationism, but not even intelligent design. Why? Because we all know that stuff is not legit. Well, what do you mean? Well, it would be in the major journals, like Nature, if it were. Well, aren't there gatekeepers in those journals? Well, that's not science anyway. Science is invoking all and only natural explanations to explain the phenomenon. That's not science, that's scientism. But I see you've got a PhD and you just forgot about the PH. So behind every doctorate of philosophy, or behind every PhD, is a doctorate of philosophy. Theology is the queen of the scientia and philosophy is its handmaiden, the hub in all of the spokes leading out to the academic, the academic disciplines. All of our evangelicals are methodological naturalists because naturalism took over the academies. And they don't even know it. They can't even sniff it out. Those of us who've been trained in philosophy and theology can help. They might be best in engineering or math. They might run circles around you. But you can see things they can't through your training. Join us. Let's together unite and reclaim the intellectual voice of Christ in the academy. And as Forrest Gump said, that's all I got to say about that. Thank you. We've got time for a little bit of discussion, but uh, before it goes. Generation Z, so you, I, I see the strategic, very strategic element of the professors. That's, you know, clearly, that's uh, very dramatic. But your statistics on Generation Z is such that the students already lost before they arrive. So, um, although it's, it's not part of your ministry, how, how, how would you think strategically about getting to them before they get to that point? Well, that's a great, great question. Uh, that's why we want to partner with the area churches as well. Uh, because most churches don't, it's not that they just don't do apologetics. They don't like to think in general. And we don't want to come along and be that campus ministry that doesn't bring added value. We want to be able to come along and show the practical value of apologetics uh, in a winsome way where we diagnose the individual, diagnose the, the culture. If they need a hug, we give them a hug. If they need an argument, we give them an argument. We follow God's leading in this, uh, but we do it. We do what is not being done because we realize what's happening on the university campuses. The average pastor, I mean, in fairness, they're not trained for this kind of stuff. They wouldn't know what to do with a Christian professor other than the ordinary Bible studies. They don't know how to integrate faith and reason, faith and life, faith and vocation. Not the typical pastor anyway. That's, that's not their bell curve. It's not their focus. And even if they thought about it, they get distracted by shiny objects quite quickly and uh, are pastoring a whole bunch of other people. So we tend to be a special ops ministry focused on this kind of stuff and uh, want to just come along and bring added value to the churches before they get to the, the universities. And if we can do that there, we can start to use that as a conduit and a funnel getting into university chapters where we're already at. Not just to defend them against the hostility, but to bring them into the army so that we can advance the cause of Christ in the universities. So we want it to be a conduit. Uh, it's one of the areas where we're raising up the army in addition to recruiting from America's evangelical seminaries and Christian institutes. Okay. I'm going to open up the questions straight away because we've only got time for a couple. Uh, Eric's hands up first there. So uh, you say that uh, the universities are kind of um, upstream from, from politics and culture and the, and the ideas that are, you know, coming around in our world, um, in our culture today. But would you, where would you say, would you say public schools are upstream from that as well? Uh, 
Uh, yes and no. I mean, the public school teachers get their education from those who are most radicalized, and that's university professors. Um, but yeah, it goes both ways, because now the public schools are conditioning them in this, these ways that we've just discussed with this new philosophy. And the public school teachers, they've been taught it, um, but they're conditioning the students for this, so that when they get there, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. And, and yeah, when you get to the university, I mean, two things happen. Um, you know, you've got frat row on Friday nights, and people are away from their youth groups, away from their families, away from their, their Christian culture if they come from a Christian background. And uh, no one else is there, and if they don't get plugged in there to a church or to a campus ministry or both, they're kind of isolated, they're on their own, and everybody's tempted everybody's doing it uh, and so they hold back because they've got conviction but then they go to their classrooms and nine out of ten classrooms are professors shooting holes in their bucket and it no longer carries water so why not do what my flesh wants to do on Friday night right and so even if that believer maintains their believership coming out of it they've been scarred they've been impacted their lives are different coming out of the universities. Yes, we need to be in, in the public schools as well. And we need to go even deeper, right? I mean, Young Life now talks about going to wildlife, getting them there. Uh, how far back can you go? Children. Uh, yeah. Okay. Abby. Why, um, why do the naturalists and Marxists see diversity of viewpoint to be a problem, considering they see the Christian worldview to be erroneous and laughable? Uh, so the neo-Marxists, why do they see... Sorry, diversity of viewpoint to be a problem? Oh, diversity of viewpoint to be a problem. Because certain views are oppressor views. Even, say, in the natural sciences, they might be views that have been shaped by a, a Western, colonialist, imperialistic perspective. And remember, in the natural sciences, truth still exists. In postmodernism, in the humanities, truth is what my peers will let me get away with. But the way things are being driven, and it makes you feel compassionate to uh, be for the underdog, be for the oppressed. They've bought into this world view that divides people into two camps, the haves and the have-nots, in class, gender, race, everything. That's, that's critical theory for you, right? So there is no truth, capital T. There never was V Veritas in that way. And so what it's about right now is reparation time. You've heard that on one issue, on racial reconciliation or reparation. It's on everything is moving in that direction. Because there's power and there's the oppressed. And that's all there is. We've got time for one more question. Mary Claire... Who's got it? Sorry, Luke. Um, so for those of us planning on pursuing another degree after NSA, what advice would you give to us on entering these universities, um, particularly when it comes to choosing a university? Well, when you're going on for grad school, you often want to find someone that will be your mentor, right? Especially depending on if it's a PhD and a master's degree, too. Um, but you want to you be thinking forward, the telos, the end goal, what do I, what do I need? Um, when we're thinking about rhetoric, ethos, pathos, and logos, credibility is important in terms of having cash value for interacting with the world in certain ways, right? Same way the dollar is, academic credentials are helpful. They're not always necessary, so you need to discern whether you're just totally wasting your time and wasting your money at some place. But if you can get into one of these places, you can start to infiltrate as they've done. It's happened before. We started them and we gave them up. We need to take them back. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muller, very much. Thank you. Okay, let's stand for the doxology. Right.